Hey guys, this is a video covering fuels on earth science for your edX cell chemistry. If you want to follow along, make sure you don't miss anything out and get loads and loads of lists of stuff you just have to learn. You can do that by getting my free revision guide, which is over on my website. A couple of key definitions you need to know. A hydrocarbon is a compound that is made up of hydrogen and carbon only and nothing else. Crude oil is a mixture of different length hydrocarbons. To separate out the mixture of crude oil, we need to use fractional distillation. Crude oil goes in, gets heated up until it is a gas. It then goes into a condensing column. All of the really, really long chain hydrocarbons, which don't um, evaporate, come off here as a residue. And we can use that, the bitumen, we can use that for making roads. It is very, very hot at the bottom, and as we move up the condensing tower, the temperature goes down. And at each different point, different length hydrocarbons are going to come off. So we have gases at the top, petrol, um, naphtha, kerosene, which is fuel um, for planes, diesel, and then fuel for boats. Short hydrocarbons are going to come off at the top, and long hydrocarbons are going to come off at the bottom. Things at the top are going to be really, really flammable. Things at the bottom aren't going to be really, really flammable. Things at the bottom are going to be really viscous, whereas things at the top aren't going to be viscous. The long hydrocarbons that come out of fraction distillation aren't always the most useful ones. We get large amounts of long ones which aren't very useful, but we don't get very many short ones which we need because they are useful. So we can crack the long ones using heat and a catalyst. And this is going to give us short alkanes, which we want, and alkenes. The complete combustion of a hydrocarbon involves lots of oxygen. That is your roaring blue flame on a Bunsen burner. This is going to be hydrocarbon plus oxygen turned into water and carbon dioxide. Incomplete combustion is where there's not enough oxygen. This is going to be your orange flame on a Bunsen burner. This is much more problematic because as well as the water and carbon dioxide, we're going to get carbon monoxide, which is highly toxic. Um, your white blood cells prefer it to oxygen, so you will actually um, suffocate to death, generally in your sleep, um, and carbon, which is black soot, which gets everywhere. There are three main greenhouse gases, with the biggest culprit being carbon dioxide and to a much smaller extent water vapour and methane. The bonds in carbon dioxide are really, really good at absorbing infrared or heat radiation, which traps it inside our atmosphere and warms the planet. Which means that when heat, light energy from the sun comes to us, it would be reflected back by the earth and normally this would go straight back out into space, but it's not. It's being trapped by the greenhouse gases, by the carbon dioxide, by the methane, which means it stays in our atmosphere heating it up. We can see a gradual increase in the levels of carbon dioxide, which has taken up speed in recent years. And there are lots of things that humans do that have a massive amount of the levels of carbon dioxide in their atmosphere. Global warming is a slightly confusing term because not everywhere is getting hotter. While we do have places where they're getting hotter, where deserts, countries, um, farmland is drying out completely, and the ice poles are getting hotter as well, which is really, really bad for the polar bears. Because they live on these blocks of ice, they hunt in the water, and when they need a break from swimming and hunting, they jump onto the blocks of ice and have a rest. The problem is, if these blocks of ice are melting, there is nowhere for the polar bears to have a rest, so loads and loads of polar bears are drowning. 
And while the ice caps are melting, it means we are seeing increased levels of flooding in other places. As the sea levels go up, certain places, starting with places on the coast, are going to start to end up underwater. While Australia is having its hottest Christmases ever, us here in the UK are having our coldest Christmases ever, seeing unprecedented levels of snow. And the climate change doesn't just affect people, it affects animals and plants as well. As the temperature changes, the top of the mountain, which perhaps used to be under snow, is now available for habitation by new animals and plants. Now say if you had a little house here and you knew it was protected from certain types of animals because it was too cold or too warm for them there. With a changing climate, animals are moving up and down slopes, their habitats are changing as the temperature changes and as the location of their food source changes. Your carbon footprint is how much carbon your daily activities contribute to the atmosphere. This is going to be impacted by things such as whether you decide to drive or whether you walk to your location. And whether you decide to eat food that is grown locally or food that has had to travel a long distance. Lots of human activities contribute to the production of carbon dioxide. Burning fossil fuels for use as electricity. Deforestation, cutting down trees so that the trees can't take up um, carbon dioxide from the atmosphere anymore. And our reliance on petrol cars. The predictions for the levels of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere is that they are just going to increase and global warming is going to increase as well. Unless we as a population decide to do something about it. One of the major pollutants is sulphur dioxide. When this goes up into the atmosphere, dissolves in the clouds, it is going to come back down as acid rain. This is going to have an effect on a wide range of things. It is going to hurt the animals that come into contact with it if a lake or an ocean or a pond becomes too acidic. That's going to start to kill the fish and the plants in there. Plants are not going to appreciate having acid rained on them so they're going to die and it is also going to destroy limestone statues which are going to dissolve in the acid rain. Too much carbon in the air is going to lead to large levels of smog and global dimming. This is particularly prevalent in developing countries. Um, When I was in Beijing, it was really, really hard to see out the window because it was so smoggy. Water vapour is going to contribute to the warming of the planet. Carbon monoxide is a toxic gas and nitrogen oxides are going to contribute to both smog and acid rain. The air we breathe is made up of lots of different gases, predominantly nitrogen gas with about 20-21% oxygen in there and then lots of other gases including a small amount of carbon dioxide. This is very different to the early atmosphere which is mainly formed by things coming out of volcanoes. So we had a large amount of ammonia, methane, water vapour, up in the air, carbon dioxide. This would have been a pretty unpleasant place to be. Ammonia smells like, well, it's a hair dye or like really, really old baby nappies. And methane smells like farts. So the early atmosphere, the early earth, would have smelt like farts and weak old baby nappies. The level of water vapour in the atmosphere decreased as it rained, which made the oceans. The levels of carbon dioxide decreased as the carbon dioxide dissolved the newly formed oceans. It turned into fossils and became locked up in rocks and photosynthesis started to take place. With the evolution of green plants, oxygen started to increase as the photosynthesis was taking place. <laughs> 